Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome our speaker, Professor Charmaine A. Nelson. We're so grateful that Charmaine agreed to join us today and to generously share her work in this forum. Her work is absolutely foundational to our own thinking on this topic, and she's made groundbreaking contributions to the fields of the visual culture of slavery, race and representation, and Black Canadian studies. She's Professor of Art History and a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Transatlantic Black Diasporic Art and Community Engagement at Nova Scotia College of Art and Design in Halifax, where she's also the founding director of the Institute for the Study of Canadian Slavery. And she's published seven books, including The Colour of Stone, Sculpting the Black Female Subject in 19th Century America from 2007, Slavery, Geography and Empire in 19th Century Marine Landscapes of Montreal and Jamaica from 2016, and Towards an African Canadian Art History, Art, Memory and Resistance from 2018. Today, her talk is entitled Male or Man, the Politics of Emancipation in the Neoclassical Imaginary. And I know you will all be longing to hear from her now rather than from me. So I will now hand over to Charmaine and I will really look forward to our discussions later. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bridget. And thank you, Charles. Thank you both so much for inviting me and welcoming, in, welcoming me into the seminar. So I'm going to screen share, but just before I do, I'll just mention that I will be using some of the colonial terms that we mine in the archives around transatlantic slavery, like Negro and mulatto, for instance. And um, I will be discussing the sexual violence that was endemic or, or prolific within um, transatlantic slavery as well. So just be mindful as uh, viewers and participants that those topics will come up. So John Quincy Adam Ward's Freedmen, Thomas Ball's Lincoln Memorial, and Mary Edmonia Lewis's Morning of Liberty, Forever Free, are three sculptures that depict enslaved black males gaining their freedom. But could these subjects be considered men? Slavery notoriously denied manhood to enslaved adult males who, as chattel under the law, were considered to lack the necessary physical, moral, and intellectual qualities. Psychoanalysis is perhaps ironically a useful tool for a critical analysis of the historical racial and sexual exclusion of black males from the category of manhood. Following Christopher Lane, a post-colonial and black feminist psychoanalytical reading in concert with discursive analysis will expose the psychic and unconscious underpinnings governing the sculptural representation of black male subjects within the context of transatlantic slavery. Freud's concept of castration is both problematic and useful problematic in its limited notion of human completeness and useful as an example of how Western thought organized and produced difference arranged around a male ideal as both dangerous and fearful. According to Elizabeth Bromfin, castration is the linchpin of psychoanalytical theory derived from paternal laws and prohibitions which rely upon the primacy of the phallus. Through it, Freud figured the male body as normative by defining the female sex organ, the vagina, as a wound or scar from castration. Castration explains fear, uh, male fear desire for the female body as a confrontation with a female sexual difference that can only be perceived as a lack. But Freud's theories also implied that the normative body was not only male, but also white. The father, as Freud's idealized organizing subject who imposed his law upon his son was a white patriarch. As such, the black body in its racial difference from whiteness replicated the female body's sexual difference as a trigger of fear and desire. For Freud, castration played out within the Oedipus complex, which concerns the father-son relationship and the incest taboo. Oedipus's patricide of Laius and his incestuous relationship with his mother, Jocasta. But if the father in Freud's Oedipal drama is always already white, are there fruitful ways to critique the ramifications of the, of the exclusion forced upon the abject black son? To figure the son as, a bla as black 
opens up a critical rereading of the son's sexual challenge to and hope for displacement of the father within the context of slavery. Slavery violently enforced the westernization of Africans. Although resistance was ubiquitous, such creolization also produced a desire to participate within Eurocentric cultural forms as exemplified by Frederick Douglass's experience of slavery. According to Gwen Bergner, quote, since Douglass writes within and even inspires, aspires to the norms of the Euro-American social order from which psychoanalysis arose, his account usefully anticipates Freudian Lacanian paradigm of subjectivity, end quote. However, Douglas also critiqued the white perversion of the natural order of the family, both black and white, by imposing a matrilineal order upon the enslaved, which incentivized rape and sexual coercion and placed white men in the double relation of master and father. But females are not the only subjects displaced through sex gender difference. One way to expose the biases of the Oedipal narrative is to insist upon a cross-racial family drama, the likes of which slavery produced across the Americas. Compared to women, the sexual exploitation of enslaved black males is less frequently analyzed and understood. However, both females and males were subjected to practices like whipping, branding, and renaming designed to strip them of their individuality humanity and dignity. The animalization of enslaved African women also served to formulate them for their role as breeders of new units of labor. However, the sexual burden also extended to black males. Historical calculations of male slave fertility or slave fertility were made through the visual scrutiny of stature, musculature and genital size supposed corporeal signs of health, strength, and virility. As such, both enslaved females and males were often publicly stripped and inspected at slave auctions. The sexual exploitation of the enslaved and the extraction of sex and offspring were seen as legitimate biological byproduct of slavery. Frank Wellesley Pittman, has argued that slave owners bought enslaved people through a framework of racialized pseudoscience, which prioritized breeding. So-called healthy Negroes were selected on the basis of a corporeal inspection where skin, eyes, tongue, limbs, and overall physique, physique were assessed. But the sexual violation of enslaved black males was not limited to white male slave owners. Indeed, Hillary Beckles has found evidence of white female slave owners inspecting the genitalia of black males at public auctions in Barbados, an act which demonstrates, demonstrates how, quote, white women were acting fully within the ep epistem epistemological, excuse me, framework, end quote. Such inspections were not merely practical, but also provided a sexual outlet for elite white females who were defined as the sexual possessions of their white male husbands and thus had little control over their legitimate sexuality within the confines of patriarchal marriage. Moreover, white women were further sexually alienated by pervasive white male sexual desire for black women, both enslaved and free. It is with this racialized sexual history of slavery in mind that I wish to examine Wards Friedman, Ball's Lincoln Memorial, and Lewis's Morning of Liberty Forever Free to question the symbolic, social, and material castration of their black male subjects. All three artists sculpted newly liberated black males, but they arguably did not sculpt black men. I have argued elsewhere that the white Negro type, a light skinned or mixed race black subject, came to stand for Black females within 19th century American neoclassical sculpture. Not so for the Black male subject. Wards Friedman articulates a so-called full-blooded Negro physiognomy registered in the full lips, the shape of the nose, and the tightly coiled hair. The nature of the shackle on the man's left wrist and the absence 
of the one on his right signals the male's recent liberation. <clears throat> the 90 degree angle of the flex bicep and forearm in tandem with the position of the right foot at the base of the tree stump served to indicate his physical exertion in the contemplation and act of standing. Created in the middle of this American Civil War, this sculpture, it, this sculpture questions the status of emancipated black males and their shift from chattel to citizen. Indeed, the pose symbolizes a black male's political, social, and spiritual transition into manhood. If men were defined by their ability to provide for and protect their families and themselves, as well as to participate in public and civic life, enslaved Africans were blocked from accomplishing these goals. The sculpture poses a critical question to the mainly white art viewing public about their own expectations and fears in light of emancipation and a soon to be post-Civil War nation. Ward's sculpture remained a small scale work. And as Kirk Savage has noted, quote, although it received critical praise, the Freedman was never commissioned at full scale and nothing like it was ever erected in public. The one possible exception being Thomas Ball's freed slave crouching like Mary Magdalene at the feet of the American Christ, Abraham Lincoln, end quote. While Savage's description of Lincoln as an American Christ speaks to his heroization in the wake of his assassination, his characterization of the black male figure as Mary Magdalene is an astute recognition of the subject's inferiority and feminization. Ward's former enslaved black subject contemplates standing up into his manhood. His faraway gaze with uplifted chin across the right side of his body conveys the idea of quiet and intense reflection. In a sense, it is fitting that a work produced midway through the traumatic civil war does not yet represent the black male as standing and fully a man since the success of the North and an end to slavery were not yet achieved. But Ward's black male is also not kneeling, nor is he asking whites, nor is he asking whites to allow him to stand. As the famous British abolitionist Josiah Wedgwood's medallion, Am I Not a Man and a Brother? While the dislocated shackles on the left wrist of Ward's black male subject indicates a legitimate, if precarious, freedom. The prominent placement of the two long parallel strands of chains that bo still bind the wrists and the ankles of the black male in the Wedgwood brooch alerted viewers to his continuing enslavement and acted as a call for benevolent white intervention. While the shackled black male is cast in a servile pose, in contrast, Ward's figure is self-contained, self-liberated, introspective, and although his muscles are flecked in anticipation, oddly still. The freedman is not in a position of gratitude or supplication, but sits still contemplating an uncertain future. Ward's black male is both powerful and beautiful. Freedman is a black Apollo, the beauty of his muscled form accentuated by the dark bronze medium. Savage has described it, quote, this superb male nude, torso pressed forward like the ancient and ennobling prototype the torso Belvedere, his arms and legs locked in one easy circuit of force as they push down against the stump, which has metaphorically held him, end quote. But black beauty was for many whites an aesthetic impossibility as dictated by decades of Western human pseudosciences and racist common sense and their confrontation with a free, powerful and exquisite black man would have been a source of both titillation, and anxiety. Whites were accustomed to exploiting Blacks as chattel, but the broken manacle on the man's wrist prominently displayed, together with the title, Freedman, boldly announced that he was no possession. Ward's Freedman and Ball's Lincoln Memorial have much in common. However, while Ward's small scale single figure work was intended for galleries and upper class home, homes, Ball's two figure composition became a large scale public monument. 
Abraham Lincoln came to symbolize America's self-sacrificing struggle to end slavery, the heroic contributions of white abolitionists and the birth of a true democracy. As with the Northern Civil War hero, Robert Gould Shaw, Lincoln's premature death propelled his lionization. Unlike the many unsung black abolitionists, Lincoln's whiteness also fueled the surge in sculptural tributes and public monuments created in the latter half of the 19th century. As Savage has argued, quote, black Americans did not have their own monuments. Despite the critical role they had played in swinging the balance of power, both moral and military to the North, end quote. While the anonymous black subject entered public tributes to emancipation by virtue of pairings with Lincoln, the comparable dearth of individualizing monuments to Douglas and other blacks is indicative of the desire of the white, Amer of white Americans to take sole credit for the end of slavery. It also reveals the concentration of cultural, economical, economic, and political capital in ne needed to publicly impose a vision of collective memory. Besides individual portraits of Lincoln, the most popular sculptural mode of representing him with, with, within a two-figure composition, which included an enslaved Black male, typically. Lincoln, always elegantly clad, usually in contemporary 19th century clothing, was rendered as a portrait, an individual, revered for his accomplishments. Although based on Archer Alexander, a former enslaved man from Missouri, the black male figure is allegorical and not named in the commemorative inscriptions. Rather, the black subject was usually a kneeling male wearing only a loincloth. Ball's Lincoln Memorial exemplifies this pattern and of oppositional racialization. Lincoln's outstretched left arm has, uh, that seems to beckon the black subject to arise from the prison of slavery conveys his presidential power and godlike authority. Yet, although the chain links are severed at each of his wrists, the manacles themselves are still in place and the black male is still crouched with the knuckles of his left hand clearly on the ground. This gesture evokes knuckle walking and may have served to liken him to Simeon's. Much like Ward's Freedmen, the black subject's expression is introspective. Although Ball's, Ball imagines him contemplating his newfound freedom, the narrative gives Lincoln credit for his liberation. Unlike the representational tropes for depicting black females, Ward and Ball and Lewis all sculpted unmixed black subjects. Like Ward and Lewis, Ball's work maps the transition of formerly enslaved males into manhood and citizenship. Yet because the literate scroll carrying Lincoln looms above the kneeling black male like Freud's benevolent father in the Oedipal drama, the power of the black male's exquisitely muscled physique is contained by the overwhelming presence of Lincoln. Symbolically, the erect, literate, sophisticated white father as Lincoln towers above the crouching, unclad, presumably uncivilized black boy, an anonymized ex-slave. Thus, the black male, despite the evidence of his maturity, is infantilized by the superior authority, pose, gesture, and presence of the white father. Compared to the sculptures by Ward and Lewis, Ball's black male has arguably taken a step backwards or downwards. Although also only partially clad, Ward's freedman is elevated above the ground, not kneeling at the feet of a white man, father, master. His moment of introspection is private and not as a display for a white patriarch or a white audience. In contrast, Ball's stooping black male figure wears two shackles, not one, and a severed chain is visible underfoot. This racially paternalistic, and hierarchical composition would have appeased white viewers' fears of black manhood and a renewed black masculinity unfettered by emancipation. As a principal orator at the unveiling, Frederick Douglass needed to walk the line between honoring the man now seen as a martyr and speak, speaking truthfully about Lincoln's political antipathy to black Americans. The speech was audacious in its honesty. Addressing the large multiracial crowd, Douglas stated, quote, 
it must be admitted, Abraham Lincoln was not, in the fullest sense of the word, either our man or our model. In his interests, in his associations, in his habits of thought, and in his prejudices, he was a white man, end quote. Indeed, Douglas presented a brutal tally of Lincoln's political shortcomings in terms of his lethal neglect of Black Americans, while positioning Blacks as peaceful, patient, and tolerant in the face of white racial hatred. However, Douglas explained that the seed of Lincoln's social and political transformation was his dedication to the pre prevention of the spread of evil of slavery within the United States. Therefore, while for Blacks, Lincoln had delivered them from bondage, for whites, he had saved the Union. While Douglas characterized Lincoln as a great man and the first U.S. martyr president, he also claimed newly emancipated African Americans and their blood-bought freedom as the source of the commemoration. Douglas claimed that Lincoln's wise and beneficent rule allowed for Blacks to see themselves, quote, gradually lifted from the depths of slavery to the heights of liberty and manhood, end quote. However, Douglas, like the Black art historian Freeman H. M. Murray, 30 years later, no doubt noticed the unfulfilled Black manhood figured in Ball's monument. As Murray noted, the sculpture, quote, showed the Negro on his knees when a more manly attitude would have been indicative of freedom, end quote. Edmonia Lewis's Morning of Liberty Forever Free is a striking example of the representational possibilities, limits, and differences between the Black male and female subject. The sculpture was one of two ideal works that Lewis completed very early after establishing her Roman studio in 1866. The other work now lost, the Freedman the freed woman, excuse me, on first hearing of her liberty from 1866, represented a boy with his prayerful mother whose clasped hands, broken shackles and kneeling pose was undoubtedly informed by the Wedgwood cameo mentioned above. In Forever Free, Lewis couples a kneeling female figure with a proud male standing with his arm raised jubilantly while his foot tramples a metal ball still attached to the links of a broken shackle. The remnants of the broken chains alerts us, much as in the works of Ward and Ball, that the liberation of this couple has just occurred. Together, the pair symbolizes the faith, struggle, and resistance of those who had triumphed over the tyranny of slavery. Whereas the kneeling pose in the Wedgwood brooch had previously evoked the Black man's request to enter humanity through white benevolence, Lewis's female coming in 1867 after the end of the Civil War could no longer be read as beseeching. Rather, her pose signals gratitude to God and not to whites for a liberty al already received. Furthermore, Lewis's standing adult male, unlike Ward's seated male and Ball's kneeling one, has arisen. His triumphant, triumphant and exhilarating pose symbolized their freedom, his manhood, and his ability to protect his female kin. The simple touch of his hand on her shoulder signaled the potential for a legitimate and consensual relationship and familial bond through the patriarchal ideals of citizenship, father, and husband. Lewis represented race differently for each subject. The standing male's facial features and hair signify a blackness that is, that is less present in the kneeling woman who, with decidedly European facial features and relatively straight hair has often been mistaken by contemporary art historians as a white woman. However, Lewis's subjects fit precisely within the racial limits of the neoclassical style of which she was a part, the black unmixed male and the mixed race black female. Despite the assertiveness of the male's pose, his sexual difference from the kneeling black woman that he guards is not secured. But his manhood is challenged not as in wards and ball sculptures by the Black subject's hesitant countenances, poses, or expressions, but by the literal lack of a penis or a phallus. An examination of the V-shaped marble folds of the cuffed shorts that culminate in his groin indicate a lack of genitalia. From the right side, his missing genitalia 
is arguably even more pronounced due to his pose, which highlights the empty space of the missing genital bulge. There is a similar lack of anatomical veracity in the representation of the lower portion of the male subject's left leg as an art form based largely upon the credible representation of the human body, an elision of this type was significant. While the line of the gastro, sorry, gastrocnemius, the larger bulging calf muscle, appears undifferentiated, the medial, me, me, sorry, maleolus, the ankle bone, which should stick out at the base of the tibia, disappears within the fleshiness of the foot. Whereas the upper body demonstrated Lewis's skill at a more accurate rendering of the pectoral muscles, biceps, rib cage, and stomach muscles, the flatness of the front of the emancipated man's pants announced the conspicuous absence of the male sex organ. However, this material omission did not symbolize Lewis's desire for a parallel social disenfranchisement or in the Freudian sense, castration, which one might associate with Ward and Ball. Rather, the dramatic absence of accurately sculpted genitalia indicates Lewis's exclusion from the study of human anatomy, a standard of 19th century art education for white men. Unclothed human subjects dominated the themes of 19th century neoclassical sculpture. A quick scan of this sculptural archive also reveals a plethora of male and female nudes that are religious, mythological, and allegorical, ideal, or even portrait figures. The mastery of the human body was attained through rigorous study in two domains. The first, life drawing classes from unclothed models through art education, and the second, human anatomy lessons through the study of skeletons and cadavers at medical schools. As one author summarized, quote, Few medical men are so capable of pronouncing upon certain points and shades of anatomical precision so surely as a deeply accomplished sculptor, end quote. However, the combination of male-only institutions and the racial segregation of 19th century American education left both pathways closed to Lewis, a woman of African and his indigenous ancestry. White elite males gained unimpeded access to both domains. Prolific, while, sorry, elite males gained unimpeded access to both domains. Prolific sexism prevented female access. While male sculptors were particularly outraged when their white female peers sculpted the male body. For instance, Thomas Crawford condemned Harriet Hosmer as follows, and I quote, Miss Hosmer's want of modesty is enough to discuss a dog. She has had casts of the entire model made and exhibited them in a shocking, indecent manner to all the young artists who called upon her. This is going it rather strong, end quote. Similarly, a panel of male judges stripped Ann Whitney's first place award for a national competition for a memorial dedicated to the Northern Senator and abolitionist Charles Sumner when they discovered that she was a woman. At issue was her knowledge of the male body that was revealed in Whitney's sculpting of Sumner's legs. For Lewis, even more so than for her white female contemporaries, all of whom were summarily dismissed under the unflattering moniker, the White Memorial, Memorial Flock by the novelist Henry James, access to this compulsory anatomical study took circuitous routes. Whitney and Hosmer, both from upper class backgrounds, use their race and class privilege, as well as family connections, to circumvent the patriarchal institutional exclusion of white women with private tutoring. In comparison, Lewis's highest level of formal education was a short period at the racially integrated coeducational Oberlin College in Ohio. But Lewis's time at Oberlin ended disastrously when in the winter of 1862, she was accused of poisoning two fellow female students. In the time that Lewis was enrolled, there is no indication that she studied sculpture or anatomy at the college, although she did produce a noteworthy drawing of the muse Urania as a gift for a friend. Lewis regrouped and moved to Boston where she was able to realize her dream of becoming an artist before earning the funds to sail to Europe. 
But extended formal training was again in, inaccessible to Lewis in both contexts, in part due to the institutional barriers, but also due to her legitimate fears of being accused of fraud. As a woman of color sculptor, Lewis's intellectual and aesthetic ambitions did not align with the low expectations in which the dominant white society sought to confine her. Lewis took to working by herself, completing all aspects of the sculptures without studio assistance. The move was no doubt an attempt at self-preservation since two years before her arrival at Rome, the white sculptor Harriet Hosmer had been accused of fraud in the creation of her Zenobia from 1859. Instead of the standard neoclassical practice of having studio assistants prepare large clay maquettes, modelli, transforming them into plaster and then roughing them out in marble, Lewis dismissed or never hired studio hands and regularly completed all phases of production by herself. Thus, while the labors of her fellow sculptors were mainly absorbed with the conceptualization of the work and the production of small-scale clay maquette or bozzetti, Lewis dispersed her energies across all stages of production. It is unclear if Lewis gained intimate knowledge of male anatomy from her personal relationships or sexual experiences. Furthermore, no records of a marriage have ever been found. Lewis undoubtedly would have heard of the heterosexual scandal that had ruined Louisa Lander, ruined, excuse me, Louisa, Louisa Lander's career a few years before Lewis's arrival in the Roman colony. Therefore, it is unlikely as a woman of color whose sexuality was fundamentally stereotyped that she would have risked an extramarital relationship. Without a male lover or husband, Lewis's personal life probably did not allow for exposure to the adult male body. The absence of genitalia in Lewis's black male subject in Forever Free strikes a sharp contrast from the overemphasized genitalia of Jean-Baptiste Bellet, a Senegalese-born formerly enslaved man, Dominican landlord and businessman. Leaning casually against the prominent marble busts of the recently deceased abolitionist, Renal, Ballet's hand and fingers direct the viewer's gaze to the large bulge on the right side of his cream-colored breeches. The contrast between the immovable white bust and the animated, colorful body of the black male further served to emphasize Ballet's anatomy as real. Although the portrait gave Ballet a level of dignity through his individuation and the specificity of his formal attire, the prominence of his genitalia may have served a reductive purpose. In the eyes of white viewers accustomed to theories and visual representations of Africans' racial inferiority and sexual deviance, Belay's exaggerated genitalia served to primitivize him, reducing him to his penis or phallus, especially through his juxtaposition with the white male symbolized by a brain or a head. Paradoxically, this sexualization of the black male coexisted with an infantilization. The excess of black male sexuality supposedly resided within a childlike form that required the guidance and discipline of the white father. As such, a so-called normal black manhood, which was neither hypersexualized nor neutered, remained largely out of reach in this art form and in this period. Nineteenth-century neoclassical sculpture was deeply invested in the racial differencing of the body. I have introduced a post-colonial and Black feminist reading of the psychoanalytical concept of castration and the Oedipal moment to address the missing phallus or penis in the works of Ward, Ball, and Lewis in order to open a conversation about the social material and symbolic emasculation of Black male subjects. The concept of castration derives from the fear that is triggered by the potential for loss, but it also speaks to the anxiety that actualizes within the moments of subject formation. As I've argued above, it is a concept that refuses the acknowledgement of sexual and racial difference as normal. Instead, insisting upon the normative body, the body of the father, only ever as white. But the black man within slavery can be read, and quite literally at that, as an illegitimate son of the white father. 
a son that did not pose any genuine threat to the father's authority and a son that could never inherit the father's paternal law. Since, as Bergner argues, both citizenship and property depend upon paternal recognition. While in the Freudian sense, this black son is not worthy to take his father's name and is disempowered by the denial of paternal sanction, within the material dimensions of transatlantic slavery, it was the white father's imposition of the family name against the child's will that resulted in the black subject's traumatic submission to the slave status. As Bergner has argued, quote, the white master is overdetermined as the Oedipal father. He is the agent of a racist social order, prohibiting black males not only from satisfying sexual desire, but from achieving basic autonomy, normative masculinity, self-determination, and access to language and literacy, end quote. While Blacks were central subjects in neoclassical sculpture due to the importance of the urgent political theme of slavery, these three works were not about slavery specifically, but about emancipation. And as such, they had to navigate the anxiety and fear that Black liberation inspired in former white slaveholding societies and populations. But all Black male subjects were not created equal. Of the three sculptures, Lewis's black male is farthest along the road to inhabiting black manhood and the subject that most unequivocally celebrates black emancipation. His emasculation in the absence of the representation of the penis and testicles occurs at a material level and is undoubtedly the result of Lewis's racist and sexist exclusion from the standard sculptural education of which her white male peers readily partook. Yet, although the educated and fastidious 19th century viewers who consumed neoclassical sculpture could not have failed to, to miss such an oversight, even if politeness prohibited them from commenting upon it, the symbolism of Lewis's powerful, joyful, standing Black male still delivered the manliness that Douglas and Freeman had noted as absent from Ball's monument. However, it would take sculptors, sculptures working in the wake of the advances of Lord Ball and Lewis to fulfill the promise of representing black male subjects that were three-dimensional, not only in their sculptural materiality, but in their full mental and physical complexity as men. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charmaine, for such a wonderful and thought-provoking um, presentation. Um, it really sort of offered me a lot of um, new directions to think about um, representations of Black bodies, especially in the context of, um, of North America. 